So welcome to the required podcast. Um, I've been trying to get this guy on for two years and he keeps ducking my calls and uh, finally um, managed to get on um, someone who I've worked with for a number of years, was the person who hired me into recruitment, um, um, Mr. Gary Eldon. Hi Andy, how are you? Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks for coming Thanks for coming on um, eventually, but um, got you here, had to wait, but got you here in the end. I'm sure you've had enough people in, lined up anyway, mate. So I'm glad you've been able to slot me in your busy your busy schedule. Now, thanks for coming on. So for those who don't know you, Gary, um, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what what your background is. Yeah, um, it's a it's a sign of age. Um, I've been in recruitment since 1990. So um, my background before that, born in Camberwell. Uh, left school at 16, got a job in in the city, disillusioned about the um, opportunity, limitations, found sales, got into a state agency, saw people driving around lovely cars, thought I'd like to do that. What do you do for a living? Oh, we do IT recruitment. Didn't even know what IT meant. Um, got a job with Computer Futures as a trainee back in 1990. Um, Realised that um, sales was definitely for me, meritocratic environment. After five years, I uh, got an opportunity to start my own brand, Huxley, which um, was in 95. Um, did that for just over 10 years, 11 years, then was brought into the into the center of S3, um, chief strategy officer for a couple of years. And then 2013, I was CEO um, and left just before COVID in 2019. So 20 nine years i wow. spent my time within s3 an amazing 29 years as well so you would have joined really early days i probably got the first office and you know very much bill and simon in the business yeah it was to be honest it was bill simon and russell um russell was my direct boss simon was a disciplinarian and bill was the inspiration and russell taught me um recruitment basically so those three were pivotal in my career um i i, I don't want to talk too much about russell because he'll love it but um he gave me the structure and um that i needed um simon gave me the discipline and bill gave me the inspiration so i was lucky enough to have really decent role models around me so Back then, um, you talk about meritocracy um, at Computer Futures. Um, you would have seen some work with some really, really good people. And, you know, rather than go off and set up their own businesses, um, Bill and Simon did something quite different at the time, didn't they? They set up Sunil with Progress, Sunil and Tim with Progressive. They set up yourself with Huxley. What was that? How did that opportunity come about? Do you know what? I think people realise, I think Bill must have worked this out, right? Barriers to entry in recruitment is pretty low. Back then it was slightly higher, actually, because it was all paper-based advertising. You've got to remember the internet wasn't even invented back then. So there's no such thing as emails or job boards. So back then you'd spend eight, ten grand a week to get a page of advertising in Computer Weekly or Computing. But, but once you've got the advertising deal, you've got the candidates, then you can sell to anyone, right? I think Bill realised very early on that anyone that was half decent after two or three years in the job and they're, in, and they're entrepreneurial, then they're going to go off and leave. And he was very, very clever and set up a what we call a minority share scheme. And he'd give you shares in the business, actual equity in the business. So my son was the first to be offered that. He went up and set Progressive. So I was like, wow. So I can set up my own business. Don't have to worry about financial burden don't have to worry about when the market crashes don't worry about advertising costs don't worry about my infrastructure accounts finance so it was like best of both worlds right you get an opportunity to run your own business you've got the support and the financial support of a of a bigger business and effectively you're left to you're left to your own devices to some degree where you go and compete um with the rest of s3 and it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a great model, right? It's, um, you know, a lot of people learned so much from that. We we retained so many people over the years. It wasn't just Sunil, but Natasha started Pathway, Sean Wadsworth started Real. Um, so there was all these opportunities to start brands and give us and get a share of your business. 
So it was genius, really. And and it, it didn't seem like you. I mean, five years, I think it, it took you from starting to setting up Huxley. So that's quite an quite an investment, quite a pun, I guess, to start that business. Yeah, but I I messed up. I spent a year. I was doing recruitment and I spent a year trying to run a Caribbean takeaway as well. So from being a top biller, my billing dropped for a year and I got distracted trying to start a Caribbean franchise like a Nando's of the Caribbean. So that that have impacted me of an element of trust for a year. So I had another two years to build that trust up before they said, right, we feel comfortable enough to back you to start something. And I was I was always very outspoken. I was a I was a successful manager. Um, I could prove to them I could make money myself, but I could also prove I'd get others to make money. So I think they saw, or I think Bill saw a lot in me saying, look, this guy is rough around the edges, um, but I think with, in the right culture and the right environment, we he can do well. And, 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 and that's what they gave me. They gave me that sort of that infrastructure to do that. So then you're able to build a team, um, the initial team at, at Huxley. What did you look for for those people to come and, join you because obviously computer futures flying progressive probably flying by then it's like right and now we're going to go and start this banking desk that you know historically computer futures and progressive had never done that great at to be honest it was um so yeah so futures had 10 year head start progressive had a five year head start and they were effectively doing the same things right they were both doing it recruitment and and i realized that if I'm going to excel and I was, and, and I was, we were doing a yod banking it banking deal as well. And I, you look at that and go, there's a lot more, it was more labor intensive to deal with banking because you've got PSLs, you got, you, you know, you've got to go through HR, you've got to do this. It was, it was painful, but the fees were higher. And then there was a young lady called Eleanor Collins who used to work for me at, at um, computer future. She went off and worked for a banking recruitment business. So I tapped her up and said, look, why don't we start a banking desk? You run the banking desk. We just start off doing IT. I'll run the commercial commerce and industry desk so we can compete with computer futures and progressive, but we'll have something else to offer. And then, so we just brought on a lot of young, hungry people with no experience. We had the right culture and environment. And then the more we went into IT banking, then we went into middle office risk. Then they wanted quants quant developer quant analyst quant traders then they want traders so all of a sudden you know the average fee might have been seven eight k in in the group we were getting 20 get 20 grand 30 grand fees back then so if we've got that and we've also got commerce and industry then in my view that was the way we could close the gap on 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 the on the other bands in s3 by offering something they they couldn't do and they all tried to break into that market but they didn't understand how to do it. They didn't have account managers in place. We had resources. You know, it was tough dealing with banks, but you had to put a lot of people to go in and keep. We used to rub so many people up the wrong way. We, we needed account managers to go in and apologize. Sorry for emailing or sending CVs inappropriate. Sorry for going behind your back and dealing with line managers directly. We spent all that time apologizing to the banks, but they knew we could deliver. So they carried on and they tolerated us. I remember one story. Um, so it was my boss, Scott, who hired me. Um, so much, much like yourself, um, obviously had you there as the as the MD, Mike Smith as my contracts director, and Scott Fulton as um, uh, as my manager. And like that, three very different personalities. And I think I learned three very different things. But I remember, I think it was just a week after I joined, um, Scott had sent an Easter egg to UBS with 17% on it and um because he was unhappy with the attempt to firm fee and uh can you imagine can you imagine doing something like that now <laughs> uh you know I, I i had my experiences i remember going to a client meeting and I, they stopped me going to client meetings and the client was complaining about our service and we were doing that badly and that badly right and i said look I'll take that on the chin. I'm really apologise. But you were taking candidates from us behind our back and not paying us a fee. We had to take the hit. And it was like, who do you think you're talking to? We're the client. You're the, you're, you're the customer. Um, you're the supplier. And I was like, well, it's a two, a relationship's about a two-way thing. 
it's a partnership. I thought this was a partnership. And um, yeah, it was the last client meeting I ever went on. Okay. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> the client's always right. Good, good, good to know. Um, yeah. I don't want to talk too much because I want, you know, obviously there's a world outside of S3, but um, the big thing that a lot of firms are looking at now is obviously the internationalization and both at Huxley and also at S3 as chief development officer, you really pioneered that move away from it being a UK IT company to a global STEM business. What was it? What was, what was, what was the big rationale behind that for you? So I wasn't the pioneer for Europe. So CF and Progressive were, you know, they're in Holland and Germany. But I realized that if you think where are the big financial cities where you, where you can basically utilize your client relationships, but also your market knowledge. So the obvious one to us was New York. No one else in S3 was in New York. So on the back of banking, we went to New York. On the back of banking, we went to Hong Kong. On the back of banking, we went to Singapore. So we're able to sort of use our, our business model that we use in the UK. Using So if we're doing quants in the UK, then you build, you, you have the same model when you go into, into the New York or you same model if you go into Hong Kong. And then the idea was once you've got your foothold there, you build up the local team, you understand the local markets. And then naturally there, you know, there are different cycles in the market that happen. So for example, when there was an IT, an IT market crash, I had managers approach me saying, look, we're doing we're doing um, software engineers. Why don't we do hardware engineers, mechanical engineers? So that drove us to do move into other sectors as well, into engineering, which S3 never did. So I was pioneering taking us outside of Europe, but also diversifying into other sectors like engineering, oil and gas, and markets like that. Um, and you went and lived in New York. Um, yeah, yeah. My 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 daughter was. Um, my youngest daughter was born in New York, actually, so she got an American passport. So we lived in um, Manhattan for a couple of years. And while I was there, we had an office in New York. We opened up in Boston, uh, doing life sciences and, and IT and banking. We opened up in Chicago. Um, we opened up in San Francisco and Houston. And then after when I got back, we also opened up in San Diego and, and Austin. So while I was there, it was very much about the American market is the biggest market in the world, is not as competitive as the UK. The fees are 30, 40% higher. The margins are higher. Um, it's less competitive, as I said. So a, a consultant that I moved from the UK that might be billing 200K in the UK, quite quickly billing nearly half a million in the US. So to me, it was um, the contract market was most contract recruitment agencies in America are 90% contract, 10% perm. Um, it was at a time where um, employers wanted you to employ the contractors. So it was a W2 model. So you employ the contractors. Um, we'd never, we weren't doing that in S3. So I, was, I pushed that instead of doing call to call, we went down the W2 model. And all of a sudden, American business was maybe three, 4% of our GP, got to 10, 15. And I think it's around over 20, 22, 23%. Of the whole of s 3 so us to me um was really an exciting opportunity it still is you know if you're talking about expansion the us market is one of the most exciting markets but you've got to do it right you know it's it's also seen as the the englishman's graveyard as well right you don't try and compete with the big american companies you know you your um your uh, decos are out there or your manpowers or being a generalist i think the more niche or niche as they say in america the more niche you are then i think and because it's such a big market being niche out there is like working a massive market in the uk or europe but if you become niche and you own the candidates you understand the market then i think it's the best way to grow so us to me and still is one of the most exciting opportunities so you came back from there then did ceo for mm -hmm. what what's what would you say the from when you took over from Russ um, to when you left in uh, 2019. What would you say your biggest achievements were? How was the company different? Contracts, putting the emphasis on contracts. We were, when I took over, I think we were about 55% perm. And perm, a great market as it is, 
Um, but with fluctuations and stuff like that, it really impacts you. And I remember, I think the big, it wasn't, it wasn't light bulb because I think it was time when you did, when we worked out the lifetime value of a contractor compared to a perm deal, it was like 50, 60% higher value. Um, when anyone left the business, they'd leave their contractors. So we don't have to pay commission. So 20% of our book, we didn't pay commission on. Um, you can plan and, and, and budget a lot easier. So if you know what your weekly GP is now, you know what it, you generally have an idea what you need to grow. So if you've got 10% finish of your weekly GP, you know you need to do 12, 20% more on your new deals, right? Um, so all those factors made it, it made more sense. I think my, so when, I think it's 75% contract now. It's, you know, if you look at the last downturn that we've hit, you see Paige, Robert Walters, they hit a lot harder than the likes of us and Hayes because of the contract book, right? And from a valuation point of view, people value a contract book slightly higher. So to me, moving the business to more contract led, I think was the, was, was the biggest impact that I had. I think the other thing, um, as well as the contract, was um, for me, and and I see it in a lot of businesses now, was the um, was the focus on the customer. Um, you know, specific things around looking for the type of markets to go for, but also things like NPS as well, which I felt really, you know, really changed the business in a lot of ways as well. So, so to me, because you, when you work in the banking market or the oil and gas market. Generally, you're dealing with the bigger corporations where customer service is imperative, right? You've got, you, if you're dealing with IT, you can do a mum and pop SMEs. You can, you can upset someone and, and then never deal with them again. But you can't do it in the banking or the oil and gas world. So I'm from that sort of background of relationship being important. I think that what I realized, I remember when I took over and I had this big strategy about customers important. Let's do customer, customer. And everyone was behind me going, yeah, customers are great, right? And then we looked at the data a year later, nothing could change, right? Because it was just a, a feeling. We need to be must, more customer oriented. But we didn't talk about the how, right? Or we didn't measure it. So when I introduced the Net Promoter Score, it was a real way of finding out what our customers felt and what our, and our candidates felt. And I could sit in a board meeting and say, right, USA, your NPS score has gone down. Your take up on your NPR score, you're only getting twenty percent of your customers um, um, actually answering them. Your candidates are only are not replying to them. So what does that say to you about a business? And so the, for the first time ever, you're able to measure how the customer, what the customer thinks of us. While before, to be honest, we didn't know, we'd guess. So I had tangible numbers to look at. And you're right, it just changed. The mindset of the manager. The manager, because you know, look, we're salespeople, right? We 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 work to numbers. So if you get paid, you hit your budget or you get your bonus. That's how the, that's how we're that's how we're drilled, right? All of a sudden, you can say, right, some of your pay or some of your reward is going to reflect on your NPS scores. Ah, okay. What does that mean? Well, you've got to change your behavior. If you change your behavior, then so you're right. I think it was a it was the hardest thing to do, trying to tell people to do it. But introducing measures that you can basically capture those measures and reward people or or you it's it's also a deterrent as well, right? Um, I think it was one of the biggest things that impacted some of the changes that we had in S3. Yeah. Still 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 had a long way to go, but I think it was moving in the right direction. No, no, I agree. So 2019 comes along, 29 years at the company. Um, you've been doing a lot around innovation, investments, looking for I guess, you know, the next things in, in recruitment. So I guess when, when you left the organization, um, what was your thinking around what, what it is we were going to do afterwards? Do you know what? I, we lived in London. We lived in Chelsea at the time. My daughters went to a, a local um, a, a school in Sloan Square and it wasn't the real world, right? It was surrounded by a lot of successful people, a lot more successful than me. But they were losing, um, I think, that the understanding of real values. You know, people turn up with their nannies, um, uh, the cars that were turning up. Right, there were no, there was no. You know, you're trying to build up a community for you, and the parties they got invited to. It was like, geez, this is a different world, and it was concrete jungle. And I think our girls were at a, st at a stage of just, you know, just my eldest was just about one year away from secondary school, and we always knew that 
we wanted our kids to be in an environment where it's outdoors, you can run around in a field. So I think at 2019, we moved out, we moved out of London. I wanted to spend more. I didn't really know my kids really because I was always working, traveling, etc. So it was about work-life balance. So I wanted to drop my kids to school, pick them up from school, you know, um, and get to know them and not be traveling all the time and leading by example. And, you know, you work hard, play hard. So to me, I wanted a balance. And the last three years at Esprit, we set up an innovation fund and it opened my eyes to, and you'll experience it, right? When we tried to do a few things, it was challenging, right? You get the board, have to approve this. We want to do an, um, you know, a video platform, which we thought was brilliant, but the board said it's out of strategy. And, and I get it, right? You know, you've got to, we do recruitment and stick to recruitment. And I was, I needed to do something that would stimulate me and do something that's different. Um, and, but not just sit around and, you know, and, and do nothing. Right. Um, so to me, it was, I found, I found myself for the first two, three years trying to find myself. I'd invested in a few things. Um, I got involved in a, you know, advisory type work. I actually made myself too busy. Mm. And then I, after a couple of years, you look back and go, okay, what are you doing? You're trying to fill the void that you had before and you don't have to, right? You just got to start changing your priorities. And I think COVID was the catalyst for me because, because of COVID, my kids were at home all the time. Mm. They loved being with us. I loved being with them. They got to know me, got to know them. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it got me to slow down. And, and now I'm in a situation where I maybe spend 50% of my time busy and the other 50% of the time having the freedom to do things. So it was a difficult time to adjust when you're in that environment for 29 years of work, 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 first in, last out, travel around the world, go out, incentives, you know, to a world where, um, okay, wake up at nine or drop the kids off at school, come home. Okay. Who's calling you? Right. Um, and it's different, right. It's, and, and it's, it's a whole, it took two, two years for me to adapt to the changing environment. And uh, yeah, so lunch clubs now are like cheese and pickle sandwiches at the park, are they? I still meet up with a few ex. We have a maybe catch up maybe once a month for a, um, a, a dinner, but it's not the way it used to be. No, not, you know, <laughs> yeah, nowhere near as well. And look, I'm an older man now. Right? I'm not interested in that stuff, right? Um, I think being in recruitment, when you're, when you're in your, I suppose, in your 50s and you're surrounded by 25, 28-year-olds, you sometimes think you're 25 and 28. And then on reflection, you look back and go, Jesus, you, you need to grow up, right? And recruitment makes you feel young, but also when you're out of it, you've got time to do act like a at your age <laughs> i only only say that i saw i saw dan and the team at high genius out of their lunch club for uh for the i think it was their september target so high genius is probably the one i associate you most with um at the moment and i know you've spent probably a lot of time over the last few years working with dan on that so um tell us a little bit about well first off why you got involved with high genius Good question. So Dan, so I've known Dan used to work for me many years ago. He left, um, set up his own recruitment company. And I think he was just frustrated, right? He says, and look, at the time we'd rolled out Salesforce in S3. It was expensive, painful. It was a horrible experience, right? Um, but I did. I was none the wiser, right? I had a CTO that would advise me what to do, et cetera, et cetera. And um, Dan said, look, I'm thinking of setting up a CRM, we're going to build it on Salesforce and da, da, da. and I'm like, really? Oh, mate, it's a competitive market. I think that, that boat sailed now. And he kept going on about it. And then um, he sat me down and said, look, I'm going to just show you how all the other CRM work and then tell me what you think after. And I was just gobsmacked of how, how bad everything was, right? How dated it was. So he, so he said, look, think about it. And I thought, okay, let's, let's do it. Right. And then COVID kicked and I went, maybe we should wait until we go. No, this is the, the right time to do it. So we sat down, we spoke to everyone we knew in recruitment, we got their feedback and we wanted to build something that was intuitive based on how recruiters think, not what bosses think. Because I'm not, if, you know, when, I, when we installed um, Salesforce in S3, 
they'd ask me for my advice and my feedback, but it's the users who use it every day. The consultants are the people that we need to make sure understand, you know, how it works. And I think Dan came from it from that perspective. And then Salesforce made sense because on the back of Salesforce, if we do the front end right, I think it, it got to a stage where we thought, do you know what? It's like um, an analogy I always use is that I, I used to drive a petrol car, a diesel car all the time. And I got a Tesla and it blew me away. It was like, wow. Um, the Everything about it, right? Um, the acceleration, the internal system, the sat nav. And the speed, you know, it, it was like, wow. And it's just like, oh, my God, I'm never going to have a petrol car again, right? Um, and to me, the way we looked at the CRM is that the world has changed, especially people working remotely, um, The the how intuitive it needs to be. If you're working remotely and you want to know how to take a job spec and you can press a button and say, look, here's here's a library of how to take a job spec, you know. it was the, It's the small things that you don't appreciate when you compare a CRM they're, they're much of a much of a much right but when you go into the detail and this is the thing Dan is so precious about right a bit of OCD about him right he's gone into so much detail about how it works the process the the UI the UX to an extent where you go you're spending too much time on that but I think he was so passionate about it so frustrated about using different CRMs so with that sort of passion I thought well you're going to succeed right so i want to back something like that so we've spent the last two years right building something that we think is fit for today's market fit for remote working everything's built in you've got your communication you've got your mis you, you know your search you don't have to plug in all these different things right you don't buy a car and then put a spoiler on it and put wide wheels on it and then put a furry dice inside and then still think you know you you think you've got a Ferrari all of a sudden. It's still a car that you've put everything on top. An MR2 with a body kit and everything else, still an MR2. We felt like we can build something that's fit for purpose to reflect um, what a recruiter thinks, but also how the market has changed. Um, have you gone about, you know, you said it yourself, it's quite a congested market. So how have you gone about standing out from the um from the crowd because obviously the, the the product is the product but what have you done differently you feel in in terms of sort of your approach to the market as well to, to be honest I, I think we've come we've come at it with when we do speak to anyone potential um clients we try and be honest with them so we want to find out what their needs are first um what their business is about and because we're not right for everyone so we won't just come in and just do a demo just for the sake of doing a demo. So people might think, well, everyone else does it that way. So not that we're fussy, but we want to make sure that the whole experience is what you expect. And we don't want to lose customers on the basis of that experience. And we've seen what's happened when companies get acquired, you know, um, when people get getting centralized teams, don't get the feedback. They're not cheated. They're not important. So, We've just come out of beta, right? So we're still relatively young. Our targeted market is, I'd say, 10 to 70, 80 users. Um, so we're not going out and saying we want to take on the world. But what we want to do is have a, a community-led platform that when we we want, to, we want to work with people that we can help as well. So give them guidance, some advice from a recruitment point of view, but also from a systems point of view. So... We've not gone gangbusters at it. We're trying to do it in the right way. Um, we've got some decent people behind us. We've got a great team. So to me, it's now, once we've got this team, we've just come out of beta, let's now be in a position that we can grow, and hopefully through recommendations, for having a good reputation, um, people will start referring us. And obviously we're on LinkedIn and trying to, but fundamentally we want to make sure that people have a good experience. So there's lots of companies that I advise to at the moment, and because of the size they are and what they do, it's not right for them. So I won't go and sell them something that's not right for them. Um, so it's just, for us, it's finding the right match. And once we do that, then then we can start thinking about how we scale. 
Um, for those of you who don't know you and haven't worked with you, um, you know, you're not generally a technical guy. I wouldn't call you a nerd. You know, you, you know, you, 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 you're what I call a classic iPhone user. You understand that, but you wouldn't do Android because it's all a bit, I just want it simple. But you're obsessive about data. You're obsessive about use of the system, making sure everything was up to date. It was, it was, it was all there. Um, why was that? Because to me, the one thing I was good at was numbers. And I also learned very early on that your numbers dictate how successful you're going to be. I knew, for example, that if I worked an extra two hours, in those extra two hours, I can send out an extra two CVs, for example. Or if I've got 20 interviews and my interview placement is one in 10, I'm going to do two deals. And if I've got 30 interviews, I'm going to do three deals, right? If I do five send outs and I'll get one acceptance out of the five, then if I do 10, so I've always, the reason why I've been successful in recruitment is because I knew my KPIs. So what's important, so so I know if I want to grow a business and, and I want to know how well someone's doing, some, a salesperson can tell you anything. Yeah, I'm great at this, I'm great at that. I just look at your numbers and say, why, are you, why is that person successful? And the beautiful thing beautiful, beautiful about hygiene is that we want to capture that information on behalf of our clients so for example right if you're sending out 20 emails and then you're getting five two people coming back 10 percent conversion on your emails that's great right and you might be able to track that or how many phone calls you're making right you're doing two two hours outbound calls and one hour inbound calls that's great but what about the stuff that's sending on your personal device so what about the sms's that are sending out oh right you're not tracking that why not well, SMSs are as big now as emailing, if not bigger. So the reason we built Hire Genius is we had everything built in so that when you run your business, not only do we want to say we want to see that whole process perfect, we want to show you through your KPIs how to improve your business as well. So we can sit down with you on a quarterly basis and say, guys, you know, you're doing this ratio of send outs, this ratio of SMSs, this ratio of, of phone calls. And you're doing these amount of deals from what you're telling us. Your competitors, I'm not telling you who they are, but they're doing 50% more on this, 20% more on this. So all of a sudden, as a business, you can go, ah. Oh. So to me, numbers have been critical to me being successful. And I think Dan has run a small, smaller business than me. It was how he used to run his business as well. So for both of us, we feel if we can know your numbers, then we can help you make better decisions. Um, and to me, that's that that's the difference. Yeah, I, I, I'd really agree. I mean, I think when we um, when we got the data warehouse S3, it was transformative in terms of being able to plan, being able to budget, being able to just have that surety around the business. And um, I think, you know, first off, you've got to capture it and actually making it easy for people to do the right thing, as you've talked about, in the right process. But then be very quickly able to read that and then impact the business makes such a huge change. I think one of the things that has, has surprised me, I wouldn't say shocked, but um, in some of the smaller businesses and medium-sized businesses I've worked with since, since leaving their series, just, just that, that probably that obsessiveness around the numbers isn't, isn't there. And, and the bigger businesses, the PLCs and the, some of the PE back firms that I've worked in, it is there. So if those smaller firms can get that, then they can, and, and also they can impact it quicker as well. Now, to me, look, if you're from a company like an S3 or a Page or a Hayes or a, or a Faden or a, you know, XS3, right? You're, you're, this is what you've been, been brought up on, right? So it's, it's, it's ingrained into you. If you're not from that culture and that environment, you might not, you don't have to do it. You do it in different ways. But to me, hopefully we can you can get the best of both worlds right and sometimes you can go too extreme on your kpis i get that right and it's it's you're not looking at the input in the right way you're not looking at the relationships right but you can even measure relationships now right if you say look what level of relationship do you have is it a, a one to five right um how long is it been a relationship for so there's lots of things but to me as you grow your business and you want to manage and expand and you start going further afield you haven't got that personal relationship that you're going to be able to sort of know everything that's going on. So the only way you can do that is through your data, right? So data becomes a critical part of how you make decisions, but it's not taken away the importance of relationships, right? You still 
got to build on relationship. So, but, but how many meetings have you been on? What type of meetings? Are they phone meetings? Are they Zoom calls? Are they face-to-face -face meetings? Right? So all those sort of things, if we capture all of that, it becomes really, really important for, I think, for businesses to, to be able, and even if you want to sell your business, right? Anyone who comes in is going to say, well, how do you manage your business? How do you manage your data? How do you grow your business? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? So to me, it's just setting, what we want to do at High Genius is give you the tools to drive your business and and do best practice when you run your business. Um, that's it. It's, it's We want it to be more than a CRM, right? That's the difference. And I know it sounds very cliche, but we want to be more than a CRM because we realise that a lot of these SF smaller recruitment businesses, they're getting neglected. No one's talking to them anymore. No one's giving them any feedback. No one's helping them. All they're interested in, are you, are you paying your, your monthly subscription? And then they're off, right? And then, then they're trying to sell you something else that they've just bought. Oh, we've just bought we've just bought a Cube 19 or we've just bought a, uh, a search um, tool, right? And they're going to sell that on top. We're saying, no, just buy it all built in and you don't have to worry about that sort of stuff. So, so essentially what you're offering as well is, is 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 the software but also the you know the support so you know effectively a quarterly business review to make sense and to you know effectively almost sort of custom almost like a csm but for your business as opposed to just your just your software use correct correct yeah to, to, to look when we when we started um when we started we always said how are we going to be different and not different for the sake of being different and i there's a since leaving s3 and i've spoken to numerous recruitment businesses it's a lonely business recruitment and it's a lonely business for owners of businesses as well because you know when you're when you're the top in your business who do you talk to right and when you want to make decisions around commissions or or around what type of pay plans or promotional criteria or expansion unless you you've got people to talk to who've maybe been there seen it done it you can relate to then it, it is really tough um and i think we all make a lot of mistakes on the way and if we can eliminate 10 20 percent of the mistakes that we've seen from our own experience then hopefully not only are we a crm we're helping you make more money and be a better business yeah, I mean, we, we see that in the community, within the required community. We've obviously got the three groups of founders, the group of sales directors. And yeah, it's 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 one of those things that if you're not working in a 2,000-person company where you can ask your colleague in, in the next office or in the other brand, you know, that. Yeah, absolutely. And we see, uh, we, we've almost created that, I feel that community. And you're absolutely right. When I left S3, it was like, right okay for 20 years you know this is what i've done you know day in day out these are the people i spoke to if i had a question i asked these people if you know I, i'd turn up for this meeting and it was like wow this is completely different and um it, it took a while to it took a while to adjust but in a lot of ways um we've seen that community yeah you know, our community really grow and, and it's a similar feeling it's a feeling of and, and I think COVID actually really helped that. It used to be recruitment company against recruitment company. Then it became, this is the recruitment industry against, you know, decimation in, in, in effect. And I think a lot yeah. of other people work together. So last up, I'm really interested in your view um, on this because you've been around since 1990. You've done your fair shares of downturns, upturns. First off, I want to know where you think we are in that cycle. Obviously, you you have know, probably some better data than, than most on that. And secondly, what are the three things that as a founder of, of any business um, of any size, you should be focusing on right now for end of 23, start of 24? Yeah, good question. Um, would like to have prepared for that, but okay. Uh, so my view is that, that I, I thought we were in a false economy before. I just... And I used to speak to a lot of people, right? And I, they, I would talk to them and give advice. And they were like, yeah, whatever, Gary. Look how much money I'm making. I'm doing yields now, 50, 60, 70 percent more I'm doing. I'm just expanding. I'm going to grow and I'm going to do this. I'm like, guys, this is, this is a false economy. It can't, it's not sustainable. Look where, and, and I didn't want to say I told you so, but it was a, it was a situation. And they weren't listening to me, right? Because now. I told you so. I mean, I was telling people to look at their job flows in 
middle of 22 when they were going down it's oh no it's easter it's the holidays it's the yeah, um, just look at just look at the thing. Look, to me and you know this as well right you're very data orientated exactly so so look and there's other factors as well right um brexit had a massive impact in 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 a lot of the industry as well let's be honest right but we didn't feel the pain of that to a while then obviously covid was obviously there's a rebound after covid and everyone wanted to feel good about themselves but when inflation start hits this sort of level and you see all these big tech companies and private equities and banks and everything else going under, you know that it's going to have a not a ripple effect. Some markets more than the others. One of the business of Moribond that I work with, we've been growing in the last two, three years, right? So, but a lot of businesses have been exposed. They didn't believe, they believed in their own hype. They dropped down on the quality of people they took on and were recruiting, recruiting, recruiting like crazy. And I won't name them, but there were companies that were 200, we're taking on 200 people a, a quarter or 200 people a month, and aren't we great? And, and, and it's 8% per, I'm like, wow, that's, that's going to fall badly. And it has, right? So where do I think we are? I don't think we're out of the woods. I still think um, we haven't still felt the effects of interest rate increases. So wow. people are on fixed deals still now coming off, people not being able to meet their mortgages, you know, and I still feel we've got the pain of that to come um the early people saying it's picking up and then you have another tough month it's not i just think maybe we've got enough thought. i'm i'm not an expert i'm not an economist right but i think we've got another tough tough year ahead and i think if you should be at the right size in your business now and then i think from there you start driving the quality things that make your business successful and so if you are going back to your question about the three things that you look out what you what you do to drive your business first and foremost is always going to be your people okay um the reason why i was successful is i people like you uh, a whole management team around me that i could rely on that were better at things than i ever was but in a market like this where things are tight you can't afford to have um extra, you, extra baggage right you've got to have a tight well-run team but with people that you trust so first and foremost i'd say Make sure you surround yourself with people that you trust and are on the same journey with you. And a lot of people get, you know, oh, this person's a great villa. That's not enough. So values, um, so your people is important. Second is your, is your values to me, right? What do you stand for? Why are you doing this? What are they buy? What you buy? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? But what do you stand for, right? And I think it's important that people are aligned to a business that they feel proud to work for. Um, you know, hygiene is we're talking about let's create a community and a culture in our business first before we can even worry about our, our customers. And Moira Bond, who I advise to, they drive a lot of things about what are we as a business? You know, progressing lives everywhere is one of the things, right? So the values become very, very important. Um, and then third, oh, people, values, know your market right pick your market right a lot of people spread themselves too thin they try and cover too much in my view less is more right find a market try and dominate the market get known in that market so your marketing is 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 in line your um send everything you do around um linkedin social media is all aligned your um your cat your training is all aligned so if you can try and get everyone to work in similar markets or find a niche, then I think it becomes easy from a management point of view, from a marketing point of view, from a cost point of view. And also you can become famous for something, right? And there's a lot of excess free businesses that have set up that do energy, but then go into a niche within energy and are bigger than what S3 are, or find a particular market in technology and go niche within that and bigger than S3 are in that niche. You don't have to try and cover everything try and find something that you can be known for. And I think that to me will make you more successful in my opinion. Brilliant. Well, so if you follow those three things, it's a great 2024 for, uh, for, for everyone. So um, Gary, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, if people want to get hold of you, um, we're going to put a link to get a, uh, not a demo, um, but a consultation with Hire Genius um, to talk about business needs and what you might be looking for. If people want to contact you directly, I guess they can find you on LinkedIn. 
And um, yeah, I just want to say that thanks for the time. Um, you know, it's it's odd that I have a guest that I've worked so much with. Um, it's normally finding out. Um, we could have probably done this for about three or four hours, but I um, just want to say thanks for the time. Also, thanks for taking a punt on me 25 years ago because, you know, I actually really enjoy this profession, this career, this industry. And um, yeah, if it wasn't if it wasn't for uh, walking into America Square and seeing you and Mike, I think yeah, who knows what I'd be doing now. So thanks. A lot. Do you know what? And and you know what? And I think you found you found your niche as well, right? We know what you're good at, right? And I think people sometimes don't want to hear what their problems are and what their issues are. And you know, you were the person that used to you know let make make the business know what the challenges are and what they need to do structurally, operationally, etc. So I think you found your niche. I I agree with you. I think recruitment. Sometimes has a really bad name, but if you think about as a as what do we export really well as a country in the UK, we export recruitment really well. You know, world class, world leaders. We are world class at recruitment. You know, we go to America and we're like, wow. You know, we can do better yields than what they can do out there. But we're not as big as America. But I think recruitment is the one thing that we we talked to some from the Department of Trade and Industry recently at an event I was at and. You know, they're now recruitment's becoming more and more prevalent. They're saying, right, there's so many more companies that are exporting. You know, look what we've done around Europe, what we've done in America, what we've done in Asia. So it's the what Australia, you know, we're very good at it. So um it's an industry that I think it's it gets tougher, but that, that means you've got to raise your game, you've got to be better, right? You've got to be better with your clients, you've got to be better with your marketing, you've got to be better about in everything that you do because we're in a world now where you can't hide because you get exposed. So you've got no choice but to try and be more professional um and, and work work in a way that your clients and your candidates appreciate you right and i think if you do that it makes the job easier yeah no 100 percent agree thanks um thanks again and um, no worries let's not leave it another two years to get you on the podcast well but maybe I'll, I'll see you and ask get an invite out to south africa that sounds like nice uh, good always time to me as well always welcome so uh, okay take care see you soon see you later take care